When it comes to electric cars, every manufacturer is taking a little bit of a different strategy. This is Out Motorsports, the channel for cars as you are. My name is Jake and I am here with the 2024 Chevy Blazer EV. This is part of GM's strategy to have a lot of different electric cars at a lot of different price points and in a lot of different segments. This is gonna be more affordable than something like the Cadillac Lyric and much more practical for most people than something like the Hummer EV, but all three of those are on the same platform. This is what they call the Ultium platform. It's their modern EV platform and it can be adapted to a lot of different vehicles. So. Let's talk through what this Blazer EV is, talk through what I like and what I don't, and then of course, how it is to drive. So first things first, with the Blazer, let's talk about the drivetrain. So you've got the option of one or two electric motors. If you get the single motor, it's going to be a rear wheel drive car. We love rear wheel drive here, because you know, it's a little fun. And if you get the two motors, of course, it will be all wheel drive. So the interesting thing here is that if you get the rear wheel drive car, it's going to have more power, a bigger battery, faster charging, and longer range. This one they sent me is all-wheel drive, so let's talk about the differences here. So all-wheel drive is going to be 288 horsepower and 333 pound-feet of torque. That's pretty healthy, but if you get the rear-wheel drive car, you're going to get another 52 horsepower, which is substantial when you're going from 288. So that's one of the elements to all this. The other thing, like I mentioned, the battery is going to be bigger on the rear wheel drive cars. So in this case, you have an 85 kilowatt hour battery on the all wheel drive that is good for about 279 miles of range. And that can be charged at 150 kilowatts of speed if you're on a DC fast charger. So road trips, things like that. If you get the rear wheel drive model, you get a 105 kilowatt hour battery pack that's good for 324 miles of range and it can charge at 190 kilowatts of charging speed. It's probably because you've got the bigger battery it can absorb that extra charging speed. That's kind of how those work. I'm not very smart with engineering, so don't take my word for it. But generally, the bigger battery, the faster charge you can, you can take on. So point being, for you, the buyer, the customer, if you get the rear wheel drive model, if you don't need all wheel drive, this is a really big thing to think about, you're going to get 52 more horsepower. You're going to get substantially more usable range out of it, 279 versus 324, and another 40 kilowatts of charging speed if you're out on a road trip. Why did you honk at me? We'll talk about electronics here in a second. Uh, so you're going to get more range, more power, more charging speed. That is, to me, a no-brainer. I would pick rear-wheel drive, but I don't live somewhere where we get a ton of snow. So just something to think about. Now this Blazer is the RS trim. This is gonna be the higher of the two trims they offer right now. There is an SS coming that's gonna be substantially faster and more sporty. So this is like the, the sort of sporty model, but there's going to be another one that's gonna be more of everything. So if you think of one of this car's key competitors as the Ford Mustang Mach-E, this is like a regular Mach-E. Ford has the GT as well that's much more performance oriented. Chevy is doing the same thing with this. They're gonna have that Blazer EV SS. That's coming soon. Now I mentioned GM is taking a multi-pronged approach here with building electric cars. They're using this Ultium platform for everything, but the software that you deal with inside the car, the interiors, all of that, they're all gonna be different. And of course the styling is also very different. So the way they do this with the Ultium platform is they basically have this kind of box that that holds all the battery cells that runs roughly between the wheels and that uh, can be resized based on how many battery cells they want to fit in there and that kind of gives the car different wheelbases so in this case this is very 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 similar to the wheelbase that they spec for the Cadillac Lyric which is a similar sized crossover it is of course going to be much more luxury focused it's going to be softer not nearly as sporty but it is a very interesting look at what you can do with sort of the same platform the same size the same specs and then amp up the power the torque the interior feel the styling to make two very 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 different cars now the lyric video is live already so take a look i'll link to it right up there and in the description but kind of fun to see the comparison now that's a positive of doing this multi-prong approach one of the issues you can have with kind of spreading yourself very very thin as gm kind of in my opinion has is that you're gonna have some teething pains. Obviously, a new platform is tricky for everybody. Going electric can be tricky because it's all new versus combustion cars. And the Blazer was actually on stop sale earlier this year from about December through January, February or so. 
they were on stop sale because several members of the automotive media had some issues. A lot of owners had issues with uh, the cars being bricked during charging, a lot of weird electrical glitches inside on the infotainment system, that sort of thing. Uh, this one has been better. GM did some substantial software updates and that's what got the cars back on sale. So anyone that you would buy now has been it's received all the software updates and, and is in theory as, as fixed as they're going to get them for now. Obviously, they can still iron things out with over the air updates. That's one of the benefits of the connected car. This one has not been perfect. We'll talk through a few things. Obviously, it just did that weird honk. I've had some issues with the, the windows not rolling up here and there. Um, just, just little stuff, the, the automatic emergency braking. Uh, it's been generally fine but it's still a little quirky. And that's just kind of what you get for new cars. But the, the benefit here is that over the air updates are a thing. GM, I think, is being pretty proactive in trying to make sure these things are pretty well sorted. So obviously they can keep iterating on everything as they keep going. So with that, let me show you the interior of this Blazer EV because it is pretty nice. I actually like it quite a bit and there's also some quirks there. So first things first, this is the key. This is just a typical GM Chevrolet key right now. So this is pretty typical, but this is where all of the typical Chevrolet kind of stops. So when we hop in this car, you'll see the interior is also pretty traditional looking, which I really, really like. They're not trying to do anything too future forward, too crazy. Now this being the RS, it's got the optional red interior package, which I love. It's, I think, a fun amount of red. It pairs nicely against the gray paint, which is good because I kind of hate gray cars, but let's hop in. Now you'll see it shows the state of charge and it says right here, close door or press brake to start. Well, it said that. So what is important to note here is there's no power switch. So there's a sensor in the seat. And when I close the door, it knows I'm sitting down. It's going to turn on and here we are. So you've got your pretty typical digital gauge cluster here. I'll show you in a second. There's a couple options for what you can do over there. And then if we take a look to the right, this is your infotainment system. So two screens going on. They do have a physical volume knob right here. And this is all screen as well. So you can see when I turn the volume up, there is a uh, kind of a little graphic that moves. That's kind of fun. And then they give you some other soft buttons down here. Now, Moving further down, you've got some hard controls for your climate control, which I really appreciate. Some of what you see is mirrored here, you know, with the, the temperature, you can use the touchscreen or you can use the dials, so that's great. And then you've got options for your heated and ventilated seats, that sort of thing. Go ahead and turn the fan speed down a touch. Now, one thing that we need to talk about is the infotainment because a lot of people have been all up in arms that GM on this car has taken more of a departure from their typical, you know, the Lyric and the Hummer are a little more traditional in that they offer a power switch to turn the car on and off. They have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The Blazer does not. The Blazer does not have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. So this is your option. So the maps here are going to be Google Maps. The car is connected and, you know, here we go. There it comes up. So this is all fine and good because it's Google Maps. This runs a version of Android's automotive OS, which is different from Android Auto. This is uh, a Google-built operating system for the car. If you've seen a modern Volvo or Polestar, they also use it. All the new GMs run a version of this, although most of them support Apple CarPlay. But point being, you can download some apps to the car. So in this case, this car has uh, Google News, Waze, and Spotify already installed. And there's also uh, the Google Play Store, so you can also uh, download other apps. You know, if you want to use PlugShare to find where chargers are, that's fine. Um, there, there are not as many apps on here as I would hope. All of the critical stuff is indeed on here, but you know, if you look at streaming stuff, the one thing I don't love, and this is a personal problem, uh, I use Apple Music, and while there is Tidal, if you want really high quality music, there is no Apple Music on the Play Store. So that is unfortunate, you can't do it here, but you've got plenty of options, YouTube Music, Amazon Music, Spotify, Tidal, that sort of thing. And then most people I think will end up using Google Maps and Waze, which are both here. You've got options for your different charging apps. So obviously PlugShare is really, really helpful. Um, and then certain other apps are also available if you need them. So. This is all fine and good, but the one thing that I don't love about kind of getting rid of CarPlay is that the car, the Blazer here is connected through OnStar. It's got, you know, a, a 5G cell signal. It's connected for eight years. It is free for eight years. After eight years, what happens? My concern here is that you've got a lot of factors at play where one, 
will the modem even be functional? We've seen this with older cars that had 2G and 3G cell connections that just kind of died when the carriers stopped supporting those. And then otherwise too, what is this going to cost me at year eight or nine when the when the subscription, the free subscription runs out? If the modem is still supported, what will it cost me? And how long will GM be supporting this car? You know, I really, I, I get concerned when I see too much with subscription services because I feel like they're tailored to the first and maybe second owner. And after that, the car becomes a little bit more of a throwaway. So having something like Apple CarPlay where the phone is what's powering the system and the system's basically mirroring your phone screen, that to me is much more sustainable long-term because as long as the screen works and the connection stays reliable, you, as long as your phone is functional with whatever cell signal and software and, and you know brand, whether it's Apple or some Android device, you're going to be good to go and it won't be obsolete. So this, I'm really unsure how this is going to play out long term. Obviously, GM's concern is that you know no one can do infotainment tied into the car as well as the manufacturer of the car, and I think that is a very valid thing to think about. But long term, you know, a lot of us in this enthusiast community buy cars that are very old, and when you've got a screen that's as big as this one. You know, my hope is that this is not just a completely unusable screen 20 years from now. So we'll see. Um, I would love to reach out. I'm going to reach out to GM and see what they say. Not so much about the Blazer, but just conceptually uh, in general. So enough about my rant on, uh, on not having Apple CarPlay in the car. I do think it's helpful, but let's talk about the rest of the Blazer. So a couple other things here with the Blazer and the screen. So I mentioned there's some of these controls right here. If you want to turn the car off, there is this touch control right here that will let you turn it off. So that is how you turn it off without getting out of the car. If you get out, as soon as you put it in park and take your foot off the brake with the door open, it turns itself off. So that's totally fine. This is your control for your uh, one pedal driving. You can change how much the regenerative braking works. And uh, this right here is going to be for your headlight control. Really, really hate having soft controls for the headlights. I think it's dangerous, I think it's unsafe, and I would rather have them be over on the instrument panel where you've got a hard control because if you're driving and it starts raining, you hit the highway. Um, in this case, I'm not towing, but if you are towing something, um, I want headlight controls where I can just grab them and turn and have it be on and not poke at a screen. So don't love how GM's doing that. They started that with the Chevy Colorado and GMC Canyon, um, and it's moved on to a few other cars, and uh, don't like that. But beyond that, I like this car. I actually like this car quite a bit. So I'll show you a few more things and then we'll get on the road. So uh, looking over here at the gauge cluster, they are doing a lot with the clusters here. So there's a button on the steering wheel that will let you change the views. And I like this because you can use all the pixels of the screen in different ways. So in this case, now I can go to a full Google Maps view. If you really want to see that, it will show you directions. Um, and then you've also got some options for, you know, this will show your um, adaptive cruise, it'll show you if another car is coming, the side strakes turn green if there's, uh, if it detects the highway lanes. Um, so just kind of nice to see different things. This is a more calm view. And then this is what I've been using just to see kind of everything at a glance. Now you've got your stock here on the left. This is going to be for your, uh, your high beams, your turn signals, and your wipers. So you've got a uh, front wiper and rear wiper control. This will do kind of the single swipe or the uh, washer fluid. And then over on the right, this is going to be your shifter. So this is a variant of the good old column shifter that a lot of you love. All you have to do is put your foot on the brake. If you pull towards you, that is neutral. If you go toward you and up, that is reverse. If you go toward and down, that is drive. So kind of nice. And then the button on the end is park. This is very, very easy to use. I'm a fan. It feels pretty substantial, pretty well built. So that is great. Steering wheel buttons. Uh, obviously this one is missing Super Cruise. They don't offer Super Cruise, but this is the same steering wheel that GM has used on some other vehicles with it. So those buttons would be here. Otherwise, regular cruise control. This is adaptive cruise. So that's great heated steering wheel. This is what changes those uh, screens on the gauge cluster. And then this just controls kind of your music and your phone and all that good stuff. Now there are some hard controls over here, which is why I'm mystified that there's no headlight control. This is going to be for your parking brake, your lane keep, the auto brake hold, and your uh, instrument panel brightness. And then this does have two position memory, so that's nice. And looking at these door panels, I like the door panels. They've got nice controls here. This is for your mirrors and windows, but just the materials and everything. This is, this is, it feels really nice. And the thing I like about this interior is that compared to the Mustang Mach-E and the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which I think is also a great car to compare against this, 
this feels the most car to me. It doesn't feel like they're trying to reinvent everything and make it super crazy. This feels, it's, it's a nice kind of snug, but not too snug cockpit here uh, for the sake of just feeling kind of cozy in a good way. And then we'll talk about how this drives, but this also I think drives really, really nice. Now looking over here, you do also have a uh, digital rear view mirror. You can turn it off if you don't like that. I like these during the day and don't like them at night, so it's easy to just grab that toggle switch. And then there's no sunroof offered on this car, so kind of a bummer. I wish there was. It would make the interior feel a touch brighter. Obviously, all the red certainly, certainly helps. And then looking down here, you've got plenty of good storage. This is a nice big storage bin with a couple USB-C charging ports. Obviously, your Camaro-inspired air vents, which I do think are pretty cool. A uh, couple of cup holders here, a wireless charging mat, and then a nice big center storage cubby. So... With all that, that is the interior of the Blazer EV. Let's go for a drive. So first things first, we'll make this easy. I've got an on-ramp right here. Let's just go ahead and talk power first and foremost. So foot in the floor. There's 65. This is uh, very torquey around town. It feels really, really strong around town with that 333 pound feet. When you start pushing it toward highway speed if you put your foot in the floor for a highway passing maneuver or you know an on-ramp run you feel it kind of hit that torque versus horsepower crossover fairly early on and then you can just tell you've only got so much horsepower to work with so uh, it is quick it is not fast but I think it is entirely acceptable as far as acceleration is concerned now, you might hear some noise coming in. That's all just piped in through the speakers. That's not the actual sound of the electric motors. They just give you a little little something fun to, uh, to listen to. If you're playing music, uh, the sound system here is entirely fine. It's not anything special. It's not badged or, or upgraded, but uh, the, the music that you're playing kind of overrides the motor noise. Now, at highway speed, there is a decent bit of wind noise. It's nothing crazy, but this is obviously not the, not the Cadillac Lyric. Um, so you get a little bit of wind noise from the pillars. But in general, I think most people will find this to be pretty acceptable as, uh, as wind noise goes. Now, ride quality in here, I think, is really well done. I mentioned I drove that Lyric recently. The Lyric is soft in a good Cadillac way. This is much more buttoned up. So the suspension is still on the soft side. It's not too firm in the city, which is something that I don't like about the Mustang Mach-E. Ford went for handling over, over total ride comfort there, I think, and it rides a little harsh in the city. This, by comparison, is much more plush in the city. It does a better job, I think, as an overall vehicle, uh, but it can still hang in a, a curve if you really want it to. That is in comparison to the Lyric, which is soft everywhere and just doesn't want to be pushed through a corner. So this will do corners better. It is not a corner carver. You're not going to think of it that way. It's, it doesn't really want to do it. And that is combined with seats that I think are too flat. So these seats don't have any sort of bolstering for your thighs. Now that might be a benefit to a lot of buyers because you just want a comfortable seat. I think they're comfy enough I wish they were a touch more bolstered for my thighs, and I wish they the seat cushion extended out another inch or so. It would just be a little bit more comfortable for people with longer legs like myself. Now, otherwise, the seating position in here is great. I'm very comfortable. I've got pretty good visibility. The belt line is low. The dash is low. Even with this big screen, all of that is also pretty low. So I think it all works out well enough. And like I said, this just feels like like very car in here. So so I'm comfortable behind the wheel and, and with everything I can see. Now, the rear visibility is actually pretty decent despite kind of the small gun slit back window. The digital rear view mirror certainly helps there. If you don't want that mirror on, you can, like I said, turn the camera view off and you've got okay visibility, but between the, the headrest for the back seats and the small back window, it can be a little tricky, but not all bad. So during the day, I'll leave the mirror on, at night, I'll turn it off. Now we have to talk braking with the Blazer EV, and one thing that I've been really impressed with on all of the GM Ultium cars is how well they blend regenerative braking with the regular brakes that are at the wheels. And regen braking is what you get when you do that one pedal, when you lift your foot off the throttle a little bit and you feel the car slow down. The car is dumping energy back into the battery and using that to slow you down, and they've got it blended really well. So. The, uh, the Blazer does a nice job of not really, you don't feel that crossover point 
hardly at all where it starts using the actual brakes the, with the calipers at the wheels versus the region. So I really like that. Uh, the pedal itself, when you do go for it, I haven't really used the brake pedal much, but when you do go for it, it feels pretty good. Nice, nice feel, nice bite. It, it's all pretty predictable, which is fantastic. We love predictable brakes. Now, as I'm slowing down with this off ramp, I'm just rolling my foot off the throttle and that's all I need. I don't really need a lot of, a lot of pedal here. Where this all falls apart for me is with the automatic emergency braking. I've left it on because I want to experience it, see how it works. I'm convinced that whoever did the calibration for the auto emergency braking never drove this car in a city because it, the, the car is terrified of its own shadow in the city. It, it is constantly panic braking for itself and it just, it, it, it has slammed on the brakes multiple times for me, whether I'm just slowly approaching someone else in traffic, whether I'm, oh my goodness, there's a Honda Accord in the woods. Okay, hope they're all right. Uh, so it has, it has slammed on the brakes when I've just been approaching traffic at a red light at a very slow state of speed. Uh, it has slammed on the brakes when I've been parallel parking and getting close to a car. It has a complete conniption fit if it thinks you're even remotely close to impacting the car in front of you. And while you can turn the system off, you can't turn down the sensitivity, at least not from anything I have found. So just kind of an odd nugget of information here in that I wish you could because I want the emergency braking on for real emergency scenarios, but if it's gonna keep freaking out all the time, I can't leave it on because every time it does the emergency braking, it slams the brakes, it locks up the parking brake, and you have to actually take your foot off the throttle entirely, push the brake pedal, and then it will disengage everything and let you keep driving. It's really, it's done it with people in the car with me. It's kind of embarrassing uh, and a very, very jolting. Um, it, I mean, it will stop you. So just kind of a weird, uh, weird quirk there. Oh, all right, and here we've got a little teeny bit of back road. So one other thing to talk about with the handling of this Blazer EV is the steering. The steering is nicely weighted enough. There's not a ton of feel here. So it's not especially sporty. And like I said, it doesn't lend itself to be that. And I think for most people, you're not gonna notice or care. It, it, the steering feel is, is good enough. But uh, this is not a sports car. Obviously doing the Blazer EV SS that will be that car. So uh, that will be, you know, you'll be more likely to have something sporty feeling with the SS. Let me see if it'll precondition. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that little noise. Uh, that's the same sound a lot of tablets make when you're at a restaurant and they get like a DoorDash order. So GM has used that when the car starts battery prepping, battery conditioning for DC fast charging. So funny to see who uses what sounds and where they get them from. I don't know where that sounds even from, but uh, I did just hit the fast charging button. So uh, if you enter in a fast charger in the navigation, it will automatically prep the car for DC fast charging. In my case, I just need to charge this before they come get it tomorrow. So uh, I know where I'm going and I forgot to put it in the nav. So I just, I hit the button on my own. But in any case, uh, the infotainment in this is really well set up. Other than my, my beef with, with the lack of car play, which I think is a valid beef to a point, this is all fairly easy to use. But in general, I didn't think I would love this Blazer EV. I figured it was, it was good to spend time with it. I'm always excited to see kind of where companies are going, especially with EVs, because you can go so many directions. And GM, like I said, is, is doing that multi-pronged approach. And, you know, a lot of their cars are very love it or hate it, especially the Hummer but they're very capable, they're very thought out, and they, from what I understand from the engineers I've talked to, the, the people that are working on them are very passionate about them. So, you know, this, I think, styling-wise, is definitely love it or hate it. Um, I've had a lot of mixed opinions from everyone I've shown the Blazer EV2, but as far as how it drives and, and how you interact with the car, this, to me, is probably my favorite of the segment it plays in because it feels the most well-rounded. So I think that is a very great thing to give kudos to GM for because you know a lot of people go too far in one way or the other and I think that's kind of how the Mach-E and the Ionic 5 are to me in their non-performance versions. Um, they, they are just not quite as balanced as I would prefer. This is much more balanced in general. So I've enjoyed it. 
there's of course little quirks and, and foibles that, you know, nothing is perfect. And in this case, there's a few things that I just don't love. But uh, if you're in the market for something like this, I think it's definitely worth a shot to go check it out. And uh, that'll be it for this video on the 2024 Blazer EV. So thank you for watching. Thanks for coming along as always. Like, share, comment, subscribe right here if you're so inclined. Tell all your friends, even if you didn't like it, tell them anyway. And uh, give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're over there. And if you'd like to meet a growing community of LGBT automotive enthusiasts and motorsports competitors, head over to outmotorsports.com. We've got a whole group over there, a whole gaggle. We'd love to be your new best friends. And we've got events going on both on the street and on the racetrack all around the country for the rest of the year. So head over there, head over to the events tab, give us a follow. And uh, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you for the next one.